Damas y caballeros, eh, nuestro segundo orador para esta mañana es el doctor Jonathan D. Moreno, profesor de la Universidad David N. Lynn Sifton de la Universidad de Pensilvania. Por favor, referirse a sus programas para la versión completa de su biografía. El doctor Jonathan D. Moreno es profesor de la Universidad David N. Lynn Sifton de la Universidad de Pensilvania, donde funge como catedrático para la integración de conocimientos en ese panel universitario. Igualmente, es profesor de ética, médica, política de salud, historia, ciencia, sociología y filosofía. Su próximo libro es Todos desean ir al cielo, pero nadie quiere morir. Bioética y transformación de la atención médica en los Estados Unidos, el cual redacta como un coautor con Amy Goodman presidenta de la Universidad de Pensilvania. Este será publicado en Libertown Norton durante el transcurso del 2019. Entre sus libros publicados se encuentran El Hombre Espontáneo, J. L. Moreno y los orígenes de Psicodrama, Encuentro con la Cultura y las Redes Sociales, el cual Amazon lo ha calificado como la publicación nueva número uno. El Cuerpo Político, nombrado por Kirkus Review, como el mejor libro escrito en el 2011, Guerras en la Mente, referenciado por el guionista de patrimonio Burn Legacy y por Riesgos Innecesarios. El profesor Moreno ha publicado centenares de ensayos, artículos, reseñas y artículos de opinión. Sus obras han sido traducidas al chino, alemán, japonés, portugués y romano. El doctor Moreno también contribuye a publicaciones en el New York Times, Wall Street, Science, Nature, Slate, Foreign Affairs, Axios.com, Huffington Post, Psychology Today. A menudo sale en transmisiones en medios de comunicación en línea y ha columnizado para el abcnews.com. El American Journal of Bio, Bio, Bioethics lo ha calificado sigilosamente como el bioético más interesante de nuestros tiempos. Doctor Moreno ha sido electo como miembro de la Academia Nacional de la Medicina, de la cual es presidente del Grupo de Interés sobre Derechos Humanos y de los Valores Profesionales de la Medicina. Asimismo, es miembro estadounidense del Comité Internacional sobre Bioética de la UNESCO. Ha prestado servicio como asesor de incontables organizaciones gubernamentales y no gubernamentales, entre ellas tres comisiones presidenciales, el Departamento de Defensa, Departamento de Seguridad Nacional, Departamento de Salud y de Servicios Humanos, Centro para el Control de Enfermedades, Oficina Federal de Investigación, Instituto Médico Harbor Hughes y la, función, y la Fundación Bill y Melinda Gates. Cabe destacar que se desempeñó como miembro del equipo de transición del presidente Barack Obama del 2008 hasta el 2009. Ha sido merecedor de un doctorado en filosofía de Washington University en la ciudad de San Luis, Missouri. Fue becario de postdoctorado con la fundación Andrew W. Mellon y ostenta un doctorado honorífico de Hofstra University y ha sido merecedor de la medalla de Benjamin Rush del Colegio de Derecho del Colegio William and Mary de la condecoración Jean Mayer de Tufts University por haber sido un ciudadano global y del galardón al mérito para la Facultad de Exalumnos de la Universidad de Pensilvania. Este distinguido catedrático ha recibido el cargo honorario como profesor visitante de Historia con la Universidad de Kent en Canterbury, Gran Bretaña. La Sociedad Estadounidense de Bioética y de Humanidades le ha adjudicado una, una condecoración por sus logros a toda una vida en el 2018. Damas y caballeros, sin más preámbulo, el doctor Moreno. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. Uh, it's a little longer than I intended, but I'm very happy to be here. This is my first time at WinSec. In fact, uh, my first time at Fort Benning. Uh, I'm going to, I hope, not speak too quickly for Maria, who's a wonderful translator, and yes. And uh, she will tell me, because I am from New York, and so we do tend to talk pretty fast. So um, as you might have uh, gathered from the introduction, I have a number of different areas that I'm interested in. It happens that I am a member of the Mad Scientist group that Ron 
uh, mentioned, uh, gave a talk there a couple of years ago. Uh, and um, the things that I will talk to you about today, uh, usually it takes me 14 weeks, several hours a week. Uh, so I have about half an hour, and I'm already late. Uh, so um, the, in a way, it was, I was thinking that what Ron does from this operational level, I, I do from the 100,000-foot level uh, as an academic. Uh, I'm in departments of medical ethics and history of science at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, and, uh, and I'm also very interested in national security matters and in military medical ethics. Uh, and as well, I'm interested in emerging technologies and the way that they um, challenge the national security environment. So, for example, Ron, a couple of things Ron uh, talked about made me think that I should mention that just to give you an idea of the scope of uh, the interests of people like me, uh, for the, the Office of Director of National Intelligence uh, asked the National Academy of Sciences to report uh, on what the behavioral sciences relevance is for, for, for the intelligence environment in the next 10 years. These are called decadal surveys. This is the first time that the Office of the Director of National Intelligence had asked for a decadal survey, a 10-year forecast of behavioral science. Uh, and um, so we did this report, took about 18 months, would be published, I think, in the next month or two. Uh, but a lot of what um, at the at the at the level of AI, what Ron has alluded to, is also problematic for human intelligence. So all of the data that he mentioned that we have access to, if you're a, uh, an intelligence analyst, um, you're engaged in what those folks call sense-making. How do you make sense of the, of the information that you're getting to, so that you can achieve knowledge? This is exactly what those people worry about. Uh, and the collection capabilities are so much greater now in so many different dimensions. Uh, and they and, and the professional uh, analysts who have to go in every day and figure out what all of this means, they have to tell a story. Uh, so I hope the next month or two that report will be available, uh, totally unclassified. At the other extreme, so Ron also mentioned, for example, synthetic biology. By the way, this isn't even my lecture yet, right? but uh, you've got me really interested. Uh, so uh, an area of synthetic biology, as you may have read about recently, is what's called gene editing, modifying the DNA in your body cells, or, or perhaps even in the cells in your reproductive material, which would change the, 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 uh, the nature of your descendants. So the National Intelligence Council just uh, is looking at how the global environment, the international liberal order, as we've called it, is changing. And uh, I was asked to write a paper on how the new genetics uh, is being managed in the inter new international liberal order, where, for example, uh, scientists in China are able to do experiments that uh, scientists in the U.S. and Europe and, and South America and Japan are not able to do uh, for regulatory reasons, for ethical reasons. So this is also another strange challenge to the, to the international environment. Uh, so can I have the next slide, please, now that I've gone already too far? So I'm not going to try to sell you my books today, but I'm showing you, although if you want to buy them, that's fine. Uh, they're all on Amazon. Uh, so, but I do want to uh, use them as uh, uh, examples of how I became interested in these issues and the different ways that these issues connect with each other. So uh, in, in this book I published, what, 20 years ago called uh, Under Risk, uh, I, was, I, I was interested in the way that human experiments are used in the national security environment. Now how, I, really since ancient times in some ways, but certainly since, uh, and including the Second World War, how uh, military personnel have been part of human experiments, uh, and how those experiments have both expanded our knowledge of science and medicine to benefit uh, civilians as well as people in the military, but also how they have challenged our ethics uh, and how the people in the military have reacted to being used if they feel that they've been used unfairly, if they feel that they've been used as human guinea pigs in experiments. So uh, under risk is the history of the way that, um, that particularly American policies have uh, tried to adjust to the greater power of science, especially 
the life sciences, biology, biochemistry, the social sciences. Um, next slide, please. So a vivid example of how controversial this can be uh, is in the case of what uh, we've come to know as the atomic soldiers or the atomic veterans. As you may know, a couple of hundred thousand Marines and soldiers were deployed uh, into Desert Rock, Nevada from the early 1950s to the early 1960s for above ground nuclear test shots. Uh, and um, part of that uh, deployment involved um, uh, actually marching into ground zero after the atomic bomb had gone off. Um, and the, and the, the reason uh, for that was to train people for the atomic battlefield of the future. The, the idea in the early 1950s, and you can even see this in science fiction uh, short stories and books of the, of the time, is that um, soldiers would carry uh, nuclear weapons on their backs, maybe like bazookas, and and there would be mushroom clouds going on all around them uh, in the battlefield. The concern was how do you desensitize the soldiers and Marines to operate in that environment? Uh, there were, now, it, it happens, and I have to explain this carefully to my students, those people were not human guinea pigs in the, in the view of the military. They were there for training, for the training of the atomic battlefield. This is called, uh, there's a great novel called Catch-22, right? So. It's catch-22. They wore radiation badges. They might be dusted off uh, after training to see how much, uh, how many, how much uh, dust got on them. Um, but they weren't considered to be subject of an experiment because they were, to, they were to be trained. A small number of them, interestingly enough, were there to be part of panic studies, what were called panic studies. Psychologists and psychiatrists gave them, uh, observed them, and they were, of course, required as the mushroom cloud was going up within a few seconds to disassemble and reassemble their rifles, something I'm sure that people in this room have done a lot, right? kind of a routine activity uh, for, for soldiers. Uh, they were also uh, given pen and paper tests. How did you feel? How much panic did you feel when the mushroom cloud was going off a, a mile or two in front of you? Um, so. Uh, but these were considered human experiments and they were consented. People gave co their consent to be put in these psychological experiments, but not for the training part of the, uh, of the routine. So this actually becomes very complicated. Uh, you might ask yourselves, well, how did those, did those 200,000 men, did they get uh, cancer uh, 20, 30 years later at a higher rate than you would expect? And the answer is apparently no, they did not, interestingly enough, although, uh, there is a special compensation program for people who were at Desert Rock or Hiroshima and Nagasaki a few weeks after the bombs, or in the South Pacific when we did those test shots, uh, Bravo was called. It would be special compensation if you do develop cancer. But as there's special compensation if, you get, if, you get, uh, if you've been deployed in Vietnam, uh, you've been exposed to Agent Orange, you can show that. But you cannot show that any individual man actually got cancer because he was there. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, what is a human experiment? I'm not going to go through all the details on, on this slide, um, especially since my Spanish is not good enough to remember what I wrote in English uh, on this slide. Um, uh, but in general, it is thought that uh, in the US military, at least, you cannot be ordered to be in a human experiment. Now, that doesn't mean that if the commander believes that there is some, some medication, or perhaps a vaccine, that is not specifically tested for the operational environment, but is approved for another environment, for a medical condition. The commander has the right to order you to accept that medication. The, the best example is the use of anthrax vaccine uh, in 1990, in the, in the, uh, it, after Kuwait was invaded and we went into Karak, Kuwait and in Iraq, I wonder how many of you had uh, the anthrax vaccine. There you are, a few. Well, um, the anthrax vaccine was not an approved medication at that time for inhalational anthrax. It was approved for the skin transmission, cutaneous transmission of anthrax. So if you're a, if you're a wool handler, you work with, with, with sheep, that's how you get anthrax, historically. 
But since there was very good evidence that it could protect you if you were exposed to Saddam Hussein's use of anthrax, uh, the Food and Drug Administration gave the Pentagon permission, a waiver, to use the anthrax vaccine and to require that soldiers uh, take the anthrax vaccine. Now, as you may know, that was very controversial when people came back because in the mid-1990s, many people believed that the vaccine had somehow uh, was somehow responsible for their illnesses, for what was what's still called Gulf War syndrome or Gulf War illness. My point is that the, the, that the morale of people in uniform, if you're going to expose them to some new entity, morale very much depends on how you present it and how much information they get and how well protected they feel. I am going to be talking about artificial intelligence, by the way, but I like to put these things in historical context. Next slide, please. So very briefly, another, uh, another uh, uh, this is a collection of papers that I did following the exposure of uh, the deaths of six people in the United States in October of 2001 to anthrax that, as you may remember, was delivered through the Postal Service. Now this is a very interesting, this actually gets into something that Ron was talking about with respect to the way that you can use um, civilian conventional means of communicating, not the internet, the Postal Service. Uh, to sow terror. Right? Uh, this is very low tech. They just sent it in envelopes. It was finally milled. Apparently, uh, somebody at, at Fort Detrick did it, although there's still people I know at Fort Detrick who don't think so. Uh, but the FBI concluded this was somebody at Fort Detrick who had access to the machinery to very finely mill the anthrax powder so that it was much more dangerous uh, uh, than, uh, than uh, normally anthrax would be if you didn't have access to the machinery. And this is, the, 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 in the wake of terror, is, raises questions about how we deal with biological threats in the modern world and how um, the, the civilian government, what kind of authority the civilian government can have to en engage in, in reconstruction and protection following a biological incident. Next slide, please. So um, probably the most relevant publication for this talk is uh, my book, Mind Wars, um, uh, which, as you can see, is about neuroscience or brain science in the military. Uh, I first published it in 2006. I published a paperback in 2012. I did not design the cover. Um, I wish I had uh, been clever enough, but I guess you get this as sort of a visual pun, uh, uh, using the brain as itself, weaponizing the brain, weaponizing the brain and defending against weaponizing the brain. Uh, and so there are a, a number of different issues uh, in Mind Wars that, I'll, that I will touch on in the next few minutes. Um, and, and, and I must say that um, this is maybe the only time in my life that I've really been ahead of the curve. Uh, neuroscience was really getting on its feet, modern neuroscience, in the 1990s. So some of you know about some of the new, new technologies that brain scientists can use to image what's going on in your brains. The biggest breakthrough in the, uh, in the, in the early 1990s is a technology call, called magnetic resonance imaging, MRI which basically uh, follows your, your, your blood, your oxygenated, oxygenated blood uh, through different pathways, different regions in your brain. Uh, and the theory is that um, at, at where the blood goes, where the oxygen goes, those are the parts of the brain that are the most active when you're experiencing something, when you're thinking about something. Uh, so uh, this, the, this imaging is also used uh, for what's called functional MRI putting something in this big magnet, very clunky, makes a lot of noise, uh, and, and showing somebody some images. And then recording the, the uh, activity in their brain, where it is, what's happening in their brains, while they're viewing these images. Now, uh, many people at major universities uh, have laboratories that are doing all kinds of work in functional MRI, as, along with other imaging technologies uh, uh, like uh, positron emission tomography, another one called SPECT, an old-fashioned one still called EEG, electroencephalography, that really measures your electrical activity. This information actually is now is being used to help design uh, artificial intelligence systems. The, the term that people are using is the neural network. So um, as, the, as we understand how the brain works, the, by far the most sophisticated object in the universe, the most complicated. Um, we can also perhaps start to understand how to design 
variations of how the brain works in an artificial context. So next slide, please. So um, there are two kinds of neuroscience, essentially. There's the hard neuroscience and there's, there's cognitive neuroscience. You might say soft neuroscience. Soft neuroscience is psychology, but brain-based psychology, more than behavior, but also the activity that's going on in your head while you're, while you're in activity. Uh, and that links up to what's going on in the, in, in the physical pathways in your brain. Next slide, please. So this is just to give you an idea of how neuroscience links up to uh, what's, what's been called uh, the third offset strategy. Uh, now, the third offset strategy was used under Secretary Hagel. Uh, this is a term, term I'm sure many of you have heard. I'm told by some people, Ron, maybe you can tell us more about this, that it's not clear that this term is going to continue to be used. So the, the, but the idea here is that the first offset was the bomb, the atomic bomb. This is a, a strategic advantage over an adversary, an asymmetric advantage. The second offset, in retrospect, was targeted munitions, uh, uh, used particularly during, uh, in the 1990s and during the Gulf War. Uh, and the third offset is some combination of uh, robotics, autonomous systems, these are all things that Ron was alluding to actually, miniaturization, uh, using data, and perhaps even synthesizing mental activity. Uh, and then doing this in consultation with the private sector. Now this actually is a complication for military planning. Unlike the Unlike the, the, the World War II era, and even through the 50s and 60s, today, to do sophisticated science for military applications, you have to involve the private sector. We, and and the, an obvious example of that is the way that Google and Facebook uh, and, and Twitter and WhatsApp uh, and YouTube have completely changed the security environment. So, and, you, and a problem, by the way, for the intelligence community is, that Google can pay a lot more to a coder than the intelligence community can. This is actually a recruitment problem. There are other problems that the, military, the, the, that the intelligence community has, like nobody can smoke pot uh, if you're working for them, whereas for Google, you can smoke it all the time. I'm making a joke about it, but that is the, the, the federal rules about, um, even about marijuana use, make it harder for my students at a place like the University of Pennsylvania to consider their lifestyle in, in, in an intelligence environment. Uh, but, so, but all of these in some way involve uh, neurotechnology, learning from the brain, learning from the human brain or learning from primate brains. Next slide, please. So um, we, part of the, this conversation, of course, is about the question of autonomous weapons, uh, also mentioned by Ron. Um, this, 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 this creates a, a very interesting new challenge. Now, in a way, you could say that we've had autonomous weapons in some level for a long time, uh, IEDs. Uh, I, these explosive devices are, in a certain sense, autonomous. Landmines are, in a certain sense, autonomous. But they're not smart. Uh, the kinds of autonomous weapon system that we're talking about in the new emerging environment are systems that can learn. Uh, and, and, and this is, uh, of course, a response to the fact, the next slide, please. Uh, that we operate in a, in a very quick environment, a very high tempo environment. Uh, now, again, the brain is of great interest in trying to learn how to make these autonomous systems, these, these systems smart, how to help them to learn. Uh, and I just mentioned two of the, of the big uh, civilian investments in the world uh, in, in brain science. There's the Human Brain Project in, in Europe, this is the European Union Project, uh, the, the, the purpose of which is to simulate the human brain. I'm not sure anybody knows what that means, but I suppose we'll, when we, we'll know it when we get there. Uh, and, uh, and of course, the, the uh, brain initiative that was started uh, by President Obama, which is now being reviewed, by the way, to, it's a six-year re review. Interestingly, the Human Brain Project is a very high-end, conceptual, data-rich project, getting data from brain, brain, brain science laboratories. The brain initiative is targeted toward post-traumatic stress disorder, which, which uh, hundreds of thousands of people have, as you know, uh, and, uh, and at uh, Alzheimer's and other dementias. These are um, medical problems for which science has no good answers. Uh, so the Brain Initiative is a, it partly gets its impetus from 
medical needs, uh, but also is providing information about how the brain works. Next slide, please. So again, uh, here we go in the direction of autonomous weapons. Again, it's the, it's the very speed of the, of the, in, of the battle environment that the, that the, in a certain sense, the human brain is the, is the strongest link in the autonomous weapons environment because it can make judgments. But at the same time, it's also a weak link because it may not be able to make judgments quickly enough. Uh, our brains make us think, for example, that if we're, uh, if we're looking at something on a screen and you hear a sound in the room and you, th you think that they're simultaneous, that you're experiencing them simultaneously. Actually, you're not. Uh, about 40 milliseconds is uh, what the human brain can process as an instant event. Okay? Anything faster than that, it can't process. So we need artificial systems to keep up with the tempo of the modern battlefield. But how much control do we have over those systems? How much control can we give those systems? Everybody in this room, I suspect, was trained with the expectation that if there was a decision to fire a weapon, that would be your decision. You would be the person, the man or woman in the loop. But now we're talking, as you may know, about man, men or women on the loop, right? being able to veto, perhaps, a firing order. But you can't keep up with the tempo of what's going on in the battlefield. What we do not want to do, at least according to both civilian and military uh, leaders in the, in, the American, in the American military, what we do not want to do is take the human being out of the loop entirely. Right? That's a good philosophy. I support that. I think that is ethical. We don't want robots killing people. But the fact is that it is going to be very difficult to sustain that approach. And I, I feel like as a civilian, when I'm reading uh, the, with the, what, what these people say, in, at least in, in, the, in the American Defense Department, people are feeling they're, they're being dragged, kicking and screaming against their will into a, a, a more and more autonomous environment where uh, the, human, the human role is being diminished. Next slide, please. So uh, I'm going to move uh, very quickly. We, just as an example, uh, this is the autonomous tank controversy. And this is an example of what's happening, right? We're being pulled in this direction, this direction of autonomous uh, con uh, control, autonomous systems. But the public is very anxious about this. And, and the military leadership is very anxious about this. Where is this going? Next slide, please. And we, of course, uh, may be willing to do things, may be unwilling to do things. We may have, uh, we may have written into our, the, ethic, the DNA of our military ethics the laws of armed conflict. We may have risk constraints on our behavior that other, our adversaries don't have. Uh, and so how do we try to balance uh, these, these kinds of morale considerations, the public policy considerations, and the need to win? Next slide, please. Uh, so these are just some examples of, uh, that I pulled off uh, uh, the Office of Secretary of Defense website for some of the uh, investments that the Army is making in brain science now, all of which have I interesting implications for uh, artificial intelligence systems and modeling artificial intelligence systems. Um, so uh, modeling uh, computer interface. Right? Uh, this is a big concern right now. How do we interface with these systems? I'll say more about that. Uh, and and uh, are we actually going to get to the point where, uh, actually, as Ron Weaverling also mentioned, we are putting devices in your heads? Next slide, please. Uh, this is just to give you an example. I'm, I think you'll have these slides. It's not, it, there are essentially two entities that I'm particularly interested in that are doing this work. One is the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, DARPA. Uh, the other is the Office of Naval research, uh, they're giving lots of, of contracts to try to get ahead of the questions of, uh, of the overlap of the new brain science and the new artificial intelligence. And uh, computational neuroscience, the mathematics, the very complicated mathematics of the way that our neurons and glions, the two kinds of cells in our brains, interact with each other to create our subjective experience and allow, allow us to act. Um, these are the subjects of a, of a great deal of concern. Next slide, please. Uh, so this is just an example of DARPA and the Brain Initiative. Um, uh, so one, uh, one of the projects is called Restoring Active Memory. Uh, how, how, what if people have brain injuries and, uh, 
and have lost their ability to remember, have some degree of amnesia. Uh, well, if you, could, if you could restore memory in people who have brain injuries, could you enhance memory in people who, ha who are not injured, who do not have brain injuries? In particular, could you enhance the learning ability of a 19, 20-year-old soldier so that a task that he or she needs to perform, a cognitive, a mental task, uh, can be learned so much more quickly uh, with, a new, with some kind of new technology that stimulates the right parts of the brain. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so these are the, the, another agency also interested in this is IARPA. The, this is the intelligence version of DARPA, also involved in, uh, in these activities. Um, well, I, for reasons of time, I'll move on. Next slide, please. Um, and there are all kinds of other different projects that I'm not going to describe that you can read about um, that have to do with uh, new ways of interacting with the environment, perhaps, perhaps through devices in, in our heads or on our heads. Next slide, please. So uh, one problem that people have when they're in combat, uh, I'm just getting now into a couple of medications very quickly, is post-traumatic stress disorder, as mentioned. Well, what if you could give somebody a pill who before they went into combat uh, would actually not experience post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, there is a medication called propanolol. It's a beta blocker. It's given to people who have uh, heart disease. And it's been noticed uh, by physicians that people have somewhat less emotional, that more, more, emotionally, more emotionally flat and stable if they're taking this medication. Well, what if you could prevent a lifetime of PTSD by, by giving them this medication? Or would that be unacceptable ethically because then you'd have a cohort of warfighters coming back from combat who don't feel regret or remorse, despite the things that they've had to do or the things they've seen. Uh, a classic medical ethics problem. Ne next slide, please. Um, so we have all these uh, invasive and non-invasive brain technologies. I've mentioned a few of them. This is, uh, this is somebody going into an MRI, a magnetic resonance imager. Next slide, please. This is what we mean. We talk about lighting up the brain. Uh, could you actually tell when somebody is saying something uh, that they believe is true as compared when they think it's false? Uh, it's not clear that we can actually do that, but there's a company called No Lie MRI that uh, has been selling machines to the government claiming that they can tell the difference between truth and falsity. That is very interesting if you're doing an, an intelligence interrogations, right? Unfortunately, I wouldn't put my money on it. Uh, I don't think it works so easily. Next slide, please. So here, this is another example of how artificial intelligence is being used along with brain stimulation uh, uh, to reconstruct an image that somebody is seeing. And I need to walk over here. Maria, can you hear me? How's this? Three spots. So what's going on here is the system has been trained in such a way that the individual sees that picture of a man on the lower left-hand corner. Uh, using brain stimulation and getting and, and fast computers and algorithms, this is the reconstruction of the image over here on the right. right? Uh, now, uh, that's not perfect. It's not a clear image, but it's a, an image that you can imagine with better technology can get better and better. This raises the interesting question, how much can you actually do mind reading? Uh, the kinds of mind reading that you maybe your spouse thinks you can do, right? or he, uh, which I get all the time. Uh, um, maybe can, can mechanical systems do that, and can those mechanical systems then project into warfighting capacity because we're learning so much about how the brain operates? Sorry, I know I'm way over time. I'm okay. Uh, so, uh, next slide, please. So there's one video I have to show you that vividly represents how this can work in the laboratory. Um, and and I, this is no audio, this is only video. Uh, somebody on the left is going to be seeing uh, a watching a video it's lying in the MRI and the system is going to uh, going to uh, show you on the on the right what they are seeing based on its reconstruction of what they're looking at so can we run that should be able to I downloaded it I hope if nope let's go back is there a it might not have transferred when, when, the, when you did the translation. Too bad. I'll send it to you. I'll send the comment to the commandant so you can see it. Uh, and Oh, maybe you, you can. It's pretty dramatic, so I'd love you to be able to see it. So, so the, great. So 
This is what somebody's looking at. And this is the reconstruction on the right. So what's going on here? They're getting information out of the brain. There are some really fast computers and complicated algorithms. And there's a library of images that are being connected through the algorithms and through the sense, the information that's coming, coming out of your brain. It's pretty vague, but they're getting something. Next slide, please. Now, uh, I'm actually going to, you can also do this with, with hearing, but I want to go to this one. I was, uh, my students asked me, can you do that with dreams? I said, no. What would it be like to get up in the, the next morning and watch your dreams? Well, it turns out that a Japanese lab is working on that. So uh, you're going to see two different dreamers, two different sleepers. Uh, let's start this one if we can. There you go. Thank you. Now, so this is an individual uh, who's dreaming, who's, whose images are being uh, reconstructed. This is, so the individual, what are they dreaming about? They're dreaming about letters, they're dreaming about Japanese characters. This is all again in a computer library of images that are being associated with the information that's coming out of this dreamer's brain, the visual images that's coming out of their brain. This is the period where they're waking up, uh, and this is what this person says, I was looking at some kind of characters, it was something like writing a paper, writing an essay. This is the second dreamer. And you can see that in, in, in part of our sleep phase is very uncoordinated. The most restful part of sleep is rapid eye movement sleep, when you're making very clear images in your head, visual images. And so gradually this person is now getting to this imaging phase. These are the kinds of images this, this person is thinking about, is, is dreaming about. Now, if you're dreaming about your boyfriend or girlfriend, that will not come up in this system because your boy, unless your boyfriend or girlfriend's picture is in the system. But if you're dreaming about a young woman or a young man and those pictures are in the system, they will come up. So you can get up someday, perhaps, uh, uh, and watch your dreams. Next slide, please. While well, somebody's watching you, no doubt. Uh, we can pass this one. This is a, a auditory uh, for reasons of time. I'm going to move past this one. Um, so this is one of the technologies that's being used, transcranial magnetic uh, 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 stimulation or transcranial direct current stimulation. This can affect perception and mood. This, can, this is now being used by DARPA to see if you can actually improve learning and attention uh, and memory. So a soldier 10, 15, 20 years from now could be going through training with TMS in order to learn a cognitive task, maybe some basic language skills more, more efficiently. Next slide, please. Um, so I'm, this is a, you can, it's also possible to implant false memories, it seems. So people who thought they were seeing that bush on the left, who actually, I'm sorry, were seeing that bush on the left, thought they were seeing that bush on the right, the big green one. Memories can be manipulated through these systems. Memory is already very unreliable, uh, and it turns out it can be massaged. Next slide, please. So I'm going to end with, with a couple of different uh, last thoughts. This is a very inefficient way to communicate on the battlefield. Very inefficient. Traditional, inefficient. Next slide, please. A Dar the director of DARPA, former director of DARPA, said to me, what if we could put the brain of a Henry Kissinger, the brain of a general, the brain of... Uh, 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 of, what, of our speakers, all the brains of our smart speakers here at WINSEC, put them all together, along with the brains of some combat soldiers. Give them a problem. The co commandant gives them a tactical problem and perhaps a strategic issue. Put those brains together. Could they work together in sync? Not by writing or talking, but could they be wired together in some way? Next slide, please. So uh, this takes us again to the notion that perhaps we can de develop a chip uh, with hundreds of thousands, not just 100 or 200 microelectrodes, pins, hundreds of thousands of these, implant them in somebody. Now here, it's somebody who has tetraplegia, right? You start with somebody who ne needs uh, some therapy, who needs to be able to interact with his environment. But uh, the question is, next slide, please. Uh, in 15 or 20 years, 
Could you, as DARPA puts it, bridge the bioelectronic divide by doing, by implanting a chip that would not only allow you to control machinery directly through, through your mental impulses, it would require training, uh, without having to push a joystick or push a button or steer a wheel, uh, but it might also enable you to talk to your fellow soldiers directly. You would have to censor what your thoughts are, right? Not everything you want to be <laughs> to go through this system. But people are quite interested in this in the prospect. Again, what's driving this is the sheer tempo of, of warfare, the speed of the battlefield. However, what happens when you uh, are mustered out? What happens when you leave the service? We take that out. We take your weapon away historically. Now we're going to take away your brain chip. Now you're living. Now you're a different person, right? In some basic way. So again, the morale issues. I'm going back to the anthrax vaccine problem. The morale issues have to be considered. Next slide, please. Um, so uh, you, you know about the uh, uh, the, the tech win uh, on in the demilitarized zone. Do you know about this? Okay. So this is a robo soldier. This is what Rod was talking about. Uh, this has been deployed at the demilitarized zone, field tested, I think for a dozen years or something like that, at least, because I've heard about it for a dozen years. Next slide, please. And there's a little video here. Um, if you thought that Samsung made a cool phone that you use, I would like to have one of these on my front lawn. Uh, this, uh, I, think, I think there's a video. This is their ad. I just pulled it off YouTube you know, 10 years ago. Uh, it's probably still up. And it's got some cool music. I think if you run it over, uh, over that image, yeah, you can, you can, you can watch it. So this thing is loaded for bear. It's got all the armaments. It's got all kinds of sophisticated devices that can read the environment. Uh, it could fire autonomously. This has been around for a dozen years, at least. But the, they haven't flipped the switch to allow it to function autonomously. There's still somebody in the loop. Right? But so in a way, what, what we are talking about today, so far in the first few sessions, it's already here. It's a political question, it's a policy question, it's a strategic question, whether you actually start to use this stuff or not, and when you start to use it. So this stuff is moving so quickly, and in a way it's already, it's really already moving in this direction. Uh, next slide, please. So this is my last slide. Uh, already, there's a system that was created a couple of years ago that can read faces better than you and I can. Uh, uh, we've all had the experience, maybe you've been on the base, there's a friend you think two blocks away, you start waving at him or her, right? They get closer, you realize, ah, oh, it's not him. All right. Embarrassing, right? Now what do you do? We've all had that experience. This system would actually make it less likely that you would do that, if you had this system in your heads. But the, the autonomous systems we're talking about will have this algorithm in their heads, as it were. So I'm going to stop there, I'm sorry I've gone on so long. I uh, look forward to some discussion. Thank you. You welcome to move around, sir. Can I shut this off? So right. I and I always, uh, I like to apologize for, for not speaking Spanish. People call me and they start speaking Spanish, and I apologize uh, for that. But um, it's been generations since my family was in Spain, and we haven't kept up with the language. The last one, that's good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, please. Morning, sir. Major Olivera, United States Marine Corps. Oh. Uh, good question with regards to the medical ethics and similar time frame, but uh, I believe it happened before uh, the Desert Rock experiment, but it has to do with Unit 731, Capital yes. Unit. Yes. And uh, how ethical, in your opinion, was that? So, uh, great question. I teach, uh, I teach the Japanese medical experiments in my class. You have to come in sometime. Uh, so, um, many of us know about the military, the medical experiments in Nazi Germany. Many people don't know that the, the concentration camp experiments were to a very great extent uh, done at the, at, the, at the command of the German military during the Second World War. So, problems like hypothermia. Uh, uh, were uh, explosive decompression at a certain altitude. The human experiments that were done on people in concentration camps in Nazi Germany were directed at, that, at those problems. And by the way, you, you may know that the United States did malaria experiments on prisoners during the Second World War. Um, but what we did not know until, I would say, uh, 25 years ago was how extensive the Japanese experiments were. 
and in some respects, the, the imperial Japanese experiments were even worse. Uh, and they took place in places like Harbin, Manchuria, uh, where I've not been, but I understand there's a museum now and a center dedicated to studying. This is a, still a sore point in relationships between China and Japan, as Japan will not take responsibility uh, for these experiments, as they won't take responsibility for the comfort women uh, during the Korean War. So, um, yeah, so 731, they were mostly interested in, in, in biological weapons. Uh, so um, they, they, they took at least 10,000 people off the street, uh, and, uh, and they opened them up while they were alive, uh, and they put uh, biological materials in their bodies to see what would happen to them. They also did some very ingenious um, uh, in engineering experiments. How do you d deliver a biological weapon, right? So the problem with biological weapons is that if they're exposed to a blast, you destroy the particles. So they had a, they had a system that they developed. Whoops. Fortunately, I was not in charge of the experiments, otherwise would have, I would have dropped all the machines. Um, they have a system they developed so that they had a couple of clay pots that were chained together. One clay pot contained bacteria that would, the goal of which was to scatter over a certain area uh, in a bioterror attack. And the, and the, but the other pot was the explosive device. So the, the, the power of the explosive device would shatter the, the pot containing the biological agent without incinerating the biological agent. So um, there was all, the Unit 731 is notorious and really it's a few courageous Japanese historians uh, who have um, helped to uh, educate us about 731. By the way, those the people who ran 731, they went on to be dean of a medical school, uh, a president of their National Institutes of Health. <laughs> uh, uh, what happened, and I hope the people at Fort Detrick are involved in this, the Camp Detrick people who went over to interrogate the Japanese scientists, many of them didn't, they didn't speak Japanese, they didn't understand the culture, we had many people who spoke German in the US, right? Eisenhower, German-American. Uh, but the Japanese were really good at concealing what they had done. Major Lee, United States Air Force. Yes, sir. So I have a question about, uh, I know there's a UN convention, or at least a, an incipient movement on how to regulate autonomous weapons. Can you talk about how our competitor states, uh, be they Russia, China, or any states, have they signed on to this? And if so, what are their, do they have any policies that guide their development? Thank you, sir. Right. Um, so there is a UN convention on, it's called the UN Convention on uh, Conventional Weapons, but it's misnamed. It's actually a convention on unconventional weapons. Uh, like, uh, so um, an example that you would know about um, is uh, blinding lasers, right? Bonding laser weapons are against uh, international law. Yeah, we have still, have not, I for sure, have not gotten our arms around the autonomous weapons problem. Uh, and whether it's possible to get everybody on the same page. Um, I mean, there are a lot of interesting ideas to, that you can read about. One idea is that there, that there should not be uh, uh, an aerial vehicle that um, is as small as the ones that Ron was just telling you about. That there should only be vehicles that, can, uh, that a human being can fit inside. So that you would, so there is in, some, one idea is that you, make the swarm technology illegal. All right, now, good luck with that. Uh, but um, there, there are, so there are a number of different ideas along these lines to somehow uh, to constrain the outer limits of autonomous weapons that can be so insidious, right, so effective, uh, particularly in non-combatant environments. Um, but the answer is, this is gonna, this is gonna be real, this is, this is really hard. And I have to say that, unfortunately, the, you know, the first mover always has an advantage in, not only in developing the technology, but also in, 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 in deploying it. And, uh, and we have several times, I'm sorry to say, been the first mover and have not said what the rules are for ourselves. So it's the, 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 the atomic weapon is the classic example, but the internet also. We didn't really, you know, in fact, at, 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 uh, at DARPA's predecessor, ARPA, uh, there was essentially one guy in the late 1960s named J.R. Licklider, who's sort of a, a legend, you may know his name, guy who was at MIT, uh, who, who theorized in the late 60s that this, the, the ARPANET would go out of the, of the security environment into a commercial environment. He wrote a paper about this. But there was no, and I know because I questioned former DARPA directors about this, there was no forecasting. 
which is what Ron's job is. There was no forecasting built into the system. Now we're trying to do that. Um, but it, so in order to know, you know, what, what the, in theory, what the rules should be, the first mover has to, has to make a commitment. Right? Now that may not succeed, right? I, I'm, I'm not a, I'm not naive, right? But it's very hard for us to come in the back door and say, well, now we've done this, right? We're sorry. We should have thought about it. Uh, we didn't think about it as much. And now play by these rules. And that's really problematic. Well, sir, I think we have time for one more question, please. Anybody want to chip in their head before <laughs> you leave? It's going to be part of the CDS or CAR. Mr. Moreno, thank you very much, thank sir, you. for such an outstanding thank presentation again. Appreciate it. I'd like to invite our commandant who will present you, sir, with a group token of appreciation. Thank you. Okay, sir. So Dr. Moreno, again, thank you for uh, a very interesting and insightful uh, presentation. I think uh, we were not expecting we were going so deep to talk about the ethics and everything else. So uh, thank you for coming all the way from Pennsylvania uh, to talk to, to our folks. And again, in, in behalf of all the men and women of Winsight, thank you for coming. And uh, we're looking forward to hearing you and, and staying connected with you again and your you, work. Sir. Thank you, sir. Please. Damas y caballeros, esto concluye nuestra segunda presentación para el día de hoy. De nuevo, muchas gracias, doctor Moreno, por tremenda presentación. Y su, uh, esta información será aplicada a los oficiales del CID, eso sí, para el curso de el AAR del curso. Así que para asegurarnos que nos dicen la verdad. Eh, con esto concluimos eh, la lectura. Por favor, pedimos a todos que estén sentados a las 11 y 15 para la tercera eh, conferencia del día de hoy. Muchas gracias.